All right. What we have here is the picture of the universal method for the saxophone by um, by Paul Deville. As you can see, it says the largest and most complete method ever written for the saxophone, based on the celebrated works of A. Mario Clausey and others. Now, the other book that uh, we're going to talk about in this short series is the Clausé. So there was obviously some crossover. Even if in the book that we use, that you and I use, the the Rubank, there are exercises from Clausé. There are exercises and and etudes from from Deville. There's all sorts of crossover in these books. Now, the thing is, of the three uh, the three biggies, so to speak, uh, they're all old methods. And you know, and I often tell my students, it's like this: there is one way to hit a ham. I mean, hit a nail with a ha with a hammer. And um, basically, there is a way to learn how to play the saxophone. Now, there are many uh, ideas on uh, what you do once you learn. But you know, from the beginning, there is there aren't many. There's not many deviations. You know, a lot of people think there's all sorts of ways to get there. But generally speaking, there isn't. Uh, generally speaking, there is one way to get there, and this is and this is how you this is how you do it. Let's see if I can make this bigger for you so you can see it, because I want you to see the preface of the book here. The preface reads: The author takes great pleasure in stating. Uh, the student, uh, excuse me, that stating to the student that everything which patient research, practical experience, and knowledge uh, from my favorite instrument could suggest has been taught, uh, brought, brought to bear to make this the greatest and the most comprehensive method for, for the saxophone ever attempted. The plan of study is thorough and progressive, and if strictly adhered to, cannot fail to produce a first-class performer. Yours truly, Paul DeVille. Um, there is a table of contents um, that, uh, I don't know if you can read this, but it goes rudiments of music and it adds like the general remarks, there's a, there's a chart of the saxophone, of, of a couple of sax, we have, we, we have to remember it now, when this book was initially, uh, we have a copy uh, from 1964, but this book came out in the early part of the 1900s was written early in the, in the 1900s. So there's some things here and some verbiage of explanations that we just don't we just don't talk about things in in that man in that manner anymore uh, which which makes these books very very interesting to me um, and we're going to get to some of them right now. Uh, this is an explanation of the methods the universal method what it's about. Uh, talks about the in, about the instrument, the body of the saxophone, uh, a parabolical cone made of brass and provided uh, with a set of keys. The mouthpiece is similar to that of a clarinet and is fitted with a single reed. The fingering of the saxophone is similar to that of the oboe. A clarinet is can easily readily master on the same after a little study. The tone of the saxophone is soft and penetrating in the upper register and then the lower register is full, rich, and profoundly impressive. One of the great merit of the saxophone is uh, its, its nobility in the sustaining singing tones. Its tone is richer and has a far more volume than the clarinet and has an extraordinary, extraordinary range of swell from soft uh, pianissimo to loud uh, fortissimo. The full harmony of a quart saxophone quartet is itself is presenting vague analogies to the tone of a cello or clarinet and oboe. Now, it mentions um, two types or two series of saxophones. Uh, if you look at series A, you will see that there is sopranino, um, soprano, alto, tenor, baritone, and bass. However, look at the keys. Sopranino in F. Soprano in C, alto saxophone in F, the tenor in C, baritone in F, um, the bass saxophone in C. And then series B are the saxophones that we recognize, 
with the sopranino being in E flat, the soprano being in B flat, the alto and the baritone being, and the bass being in E flat, the tenor and the bass saxophone, not, I'm sorry, the contrabass in E flat, and the bass saxophone in B flat. The first series are for orchestral use. Now, those instruments, frankly, aren't made anymore. That's why, you know, getting one of these books, one of these universal methods, is a good idea to start with because there's so much history in the written part of it that I think that is, that that's being lost and that we need to really, really, you know, start looking at. Now, here's a list of terms. Please check out the terms. Here's something that I thought was really fun. How to make your own reeds. We have to remember at one point, you couldn't just run down to the local music store and buy reeds. I know that seems crazy. You know what else you couldn't do? You couldn't get on Amazon and just order some reeds to have them dropped off at your house. I know that that's bizarre to some of you that you just couldn't get on Amazon or you couldn't um, get on eBay and just order reeds. So the book said, hey, listen, while reeds of the best quality may now be obtained in music supply houses, some performers still prefer to make their own reeds. And at least some knowledge of the process of reed making or correcting faults is invaluable. And that's true. Um, and it shows and tells how to do just that. There you go. That's, that, that's kind of cool. And then we get into rudiments. These books go through a lot. They are what, what I call cradle, cradle to the grave absolute cradle to the grave here's here's some more rudiments we talk about minor scales um there's some stuff about shades of tone and you know and, and dynamics uh grace notes embellishments of the appoggiatura how they're played how they're written um let's see here and here are which which again i find extremely fun here are some um, first new patent and the high high E flat and high D, I excuse me the E and the F key, which weren't there initially. They weren't there. So the some of the new instruments, according to the Universal Book, are instruments that have the high E and the high F key. Again, some of this stuff is has been lost. Uh, some of the older instruments had what we call a forked E flat. And so you can experience some of that knowledge. And hardly any of that stuff works on your instrument, but but let's get to the, the stuff you'll use. Some pre 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 um, excuse me, preparatory exercises for the production of tone. There we go. It's A lot of these books start off the very same way. Um, it says here, note, it's taken for granted that the student has already made himself acquainted with the rudiments of music. That was all the stuff that was before you actually put the instrument in your face in this particular book. And it talks about tonguing it, and the T's mean to tongue it, and it has the breath marks to get you started. And again, cradle to the grave. Here's where you start. It's not really that dissimilar from where a lot of you started with me in the Rubank book. It starts off scales a lot faster, but it's still whole notes. And it's still some of the other notes. As we sort of, um, we're sort of getting through here. Now we start talking about dynamics fairly soon in exercise 24, which we haven't done that in the Rubank book. And there's three verbs, and there's three versions of the Rubank book. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna jet ahead here and start getting into a, so some exercises that may be a little bit more. There you go. Some eighth note exercises. We're still in the key of C. We see eighth notes and sixteenth notes. And as we grow and as we get faster and faster and now we are going to study scales 
again, a lot of the same way. Um, there's some construction of scales information here by Paul Deville in the in the C, in the in the major scales, and they go ahead and approach the minor scale right away. There isn't any reason why not. While you think everything's easy, we're going to go ahead and address all of this. And this is sort of how this book is put together. It is progressive in, in the sense that once you do one thing, now you know the other thing. Now, the, the, you remember how we introduced the, the E and the F key for the hop upper octave? And now here is some, are some exercises by which to practice them because we've already introduced them. Now we need to work on them. We talked about grace notes and embellishments, and here are some, and, and here in the in the text are some great, um, some, some great information on what they are and why we use them. I got again a lot of these books, especially this book, has some great written information. It isn't just the playing. So it isn't just like someone would go through and play these exercises for you that that would do you a lot of good. It is the reading of what's there that's going to do you the most good, especially some of the historic stuff. And there is, and there are some trills and and other exercises, and we're just going to zip through and um, give you an idea because this is just to give you an idea of what's in the book. There we go. Now we're back to duets, and you guys know how much I love to play duets. And in these duets are some of the things that we've already learned, uh, some rhythms that we've already learned, the dynamics we've already learned. Uh, again, we're and, and we're going to move progressively in keys. There we go. We're in we're in C. I think this is in C. I think, and then we're in G, and we're going to skip through. And now where that one's in F, or it could be in 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 D minor. And there's another one that's probably in F. Triplets. And we have lots of exercises, and, and, and they, you can see how they get a little bit more challenging, both in rhythm and um, alacrity and in key signatures. There we go. Back to syncopation exercises. A lot like the syncopation exercises that we see in the intermediate book in the Rubank series. Let's see if we can scooch ahead. There's lots of pages in this book. This is one of the ones that you use forever. A major, here's our, more scale exercises. Our, our A major scale and our F sharp minor scale, they share a key signature. They are relative They are relative to each other. So that kind of stuff's in this book. We're gonna also, there you go, um, some exercises. Theme, or, or etudes, theme with nine easy variations. This is very, very fun. This is a lot of fun to master these variations of the very simple melody. And then we do it again because the because theme and variations is a very, very important aspect of a lot of composers. And like I said, because it's cradle to the grave, some of the other some of these other exercises, there you go, it's another etude, they can get pretty they can get pretty tough, they can get pretty hard. And some of these, of course, you'd practice slowly, and then you'd get them up to speed. It's pretty fascinating. It's cool. There's some of the ornamentation stuff there. Wait, 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 wait. I just passed one that I thought would be cool. That 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 one's cool. No, that one there. There we go. Da da dee da 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 the book is full of these as you as you move on in your development. Thirty second notes. And we have thirty second note runs here at Vivace. It would take a while to work these up, and that's the whole point. There are some sixteenth note triplets. Uh, at Vivo, it would take a while to work these up, and there we go. It starts getting chromatic, and it starts getting a little, a little key, a little chromatic, and um, 
a little complicated, you know, what in, in, in the keystrokes we have a D, a C sharp, a D, a D sharp, a C double sharp, a D, a D sharp, an E, a D sh is still a D sharp, an E, an F, F sharp, a G sharp, an F sharp, and it's and, and, and on and on and on. So it starts to move uh, chromatically. Now there are solos in the book, which are always good to practice the solos, and that way that you get some uh, get some idea. Of, uh, of ways to use the things that you've learned, just like in the Rubank book, just like the Rubank book. Let's see here, and and of course, of course, some of them are of increasing difficulty. Oh, and some of these are awesome because they're older. They sound older. They sound like they came uh, from an you know from a bygone era. Some of them came from the 1900s. Let's see if we can find out when this one was. There we go. This is 1908, I believe. Anybody read, um, anybody still read Roman numerals? I believe that's 1908. Or, yeah, because that's 7, 1907. Because that's 1907. So some of these are really cool to do because they sound as old as they are. Uh, some of the old transcriptions are as as sound as old same same era. This is the next year, 1908. Um, so that's the so that is what's in the kind of things that that's in the universal method. If you're wondering which one should I get, which one should I play out of, I chose. I personally just chose the Rubank uh, for a couple of reasons. It's the one I like. And I like it simply because it's one of the ones that I grew up on, and I think it has um, all the thing. All of them have the things that we need to to be able to play from and to be able to learn from. I find the older methods are interesting in the text, and the universal method for me is interesting in the text. So you really should. So you really should own a copy of it. You really should own a copy of the um, of the book. You really should. 